I came across this family this week. They were married before his death. They were married 86 years. It's Herbert and Zelmeyer Fisher. Just imagine that. I don't think there's anybody in the room that's, is there anybody in the room 86 years old or older? Anybody? I don't, I don't think so. There's nobody even in this room that old. And, and these people, they got married when they were zero. <laughs> uh, they got married out of the womb. They were married 86 years. They are the longest in America, the longest couple that had ever been married before his death. And their advice was trust one another, communicate with each other. No, no nothing profound. Just do what you're supposed to do. And they were married for 80 years. Just imagine, 86 years. Not how old, I'm just trying to, some of you who are younger, you mean they were 86 years old. No, they were married for 86 years. It's God's intention that your relationships have him right in the middle of everything. And we began with this text last week. Let's go back to it from the book of Nehemiah for a minute. After I looked things over and I stood up and I said to the nobles, this is Nehemiah, he's building a wall, right? He's actually rebuilding a city. There's lots of opposition. There's internal opposition. There's external opposition. There are challenges. How many of you have ever faced challenges in your relationships? I looked things over. I said to the nobles, I looked things over. You got to... Take a hard look at things. Don't ignore it. Evaluate accurately. I looked things over. And I said to everybody, don't be afraid. Look at somebody and say, don't be afraid. There's nothing that God can't fix. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. And and here it is. Fight for your families, your sons, and your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Can you say that? That line with me, ready? And fight for your families, your sons, daughters, your wives, and your homes. Let's put this in context and what he's really talking about here. Here's the verses that surround that fight for your families. But soon word was going around in Judah. Everybody ever heard of a word going around? Somebody said, they say, who's they? Word's getting around. The builders are pooped. (laughs) Let me ask you, have you ever just been tired sometimes and you say it's just too much? The builders are pooped. The rubbish piles up from years of stuff. We're in over our heads. This is too much for me. I need you to understand you're not the exception to the rule. Nobody knows my issue. Nobody knows my problem. Nobody else has been through what I've been through. Stop it. You're not the exception to the rule. Everybody experiences the same stuff. Don't let the enemy of your soul think it's only you. Nobody understands me. Stop. That's not true. We're in over our heads. We can't build this wall. And and all this time our enemies were saying they won't know what hit them. All this time, the enemy in your head saying, it's not going to work out. It's not going to get better. Before they know it, we'll be at their throats, killing them right and left. That'll put a stop to that family and that marriage and those kids. The Jews who were their neighbors kept reporting, they have us surrounded. They're going to attack. If we heard it once, we heard it ten times. So I stationed armed guards at the most vulnerable places on the wall. I would suggest for some of you, this may sound crazy, but I would suggest you go to Walmart or Food Line and buy a bottle of olive oil and walk around your house and take that oil and anoint the doors of your house and say, not in this house in Jesus' name. Serious. Take authority over that house. They've got us surrounded. They're going to attack. If we heard it once, we heard it ten times. I stationed armed guards at the most vulnerable places of the wall. We all have vulnerabilities, and I assign people by families with their swords, by families, lances and bows, and looking things over, I stood up and spoke to the nobles, officials, and everyone else. Now, here's the context. Don't be afraid of them. 
Put your minds on the master, great and awesome, and then fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Okay. God is for you. God is with you. Look at somebody and say, God's with us. What we sometimes don't realize is that we're fighting one another, we're fighting issues, or we're fighting rebellion, or we're fighting addictions, or we're fighting pornography, or we're fighting something. That's not where the real battle is. Because the real fight that you and I have is not with what we can see, the real fight is with what we cannot see. And if I'm going to win an unseen battle, that means I have to use weapons that are not natural, but are supernatural. Somehow I have to understand that just the natural stuff, my own ingenuity, my own wisdom, my own knowledge, what worked before may not work this time. Listen to me. Sometimes you have to work things out, but other times you have to cast things out. And there comes a place where we move from the natural into the supernatural into our homes and we say, I'm going to fight. I'm not going to fight you. I'm going to fight what the real issue is here. Because a lot of times people are driven and act the way they do, say the things they say, think the way that they think, not simply because that's just who they are, it's because they're driven by something that is unseen. Let me say it again. Sometimes you work things out, sometimes you have to cast things out. So let's look at the first relationship that ever happened. It's Adam and Eve. God creates a world. It wouldn't make any sense for God to create a world and put man in it first. He creates the environment first. Don't miss this. God creates the perfect environment. Then he places man within the environment. And then he will say it's not good that man is alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. Okay, the word helper here is really somebody that comes alongside and, and assists and compliments because I don't have it all within me. My wife Tiffany doesn't have it all within her, but where she lacks, I make up the difference. Where I lack, she makes up the difference. That, that, that's how this is supposed to work. And so we would think that when God would say, it's not good that man would be alone. The next thing that God would do is he would create the woman. But that's not what happens. Watch this. The Lord says, it's not good for man to be alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. And the next thing is, oh, God's going to create the woman, right? Nope. Now, the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. And he brought them to man to see what he would name them. Whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the reason we call a giraffe a giraffe is because Adam said that's a giraffe. The reason we call a cow, cows, because Adam said that's a cow. The reason we call a chicken, a chicken, because Adam said, oh, that's a chicken. Why does God have Adam naming the animals before he creates a woman? It's because he wanted Adam to understand the power of his words, and whatever he identified the animals to be, that's what they were going to be. And whatever came out of his mouth was going to identify what that woman was going to be. And so he wanted Adam to understand, listen, when you open up your mouth, you're going to create identity in this woman. Be careful what you say. This is the reason why we create identities in one another by the words that come out of our mouth, the words of a husband to a wife, a wife to a husband, parents to children. And so, so God says, listen, I'm going to have you name the animals first, Adam, because I want you to understand the power of your words over what I'm getting ready to bring into your life. You need to grab this. Your words have power. You realize how many of us in our own homes are defeating the victory that we want just because of the things that we're saying over one another? No, oh, you'll never be this. You'll never be that. You're dumb. You're stupid. You're 
You know, you never. That's a problem, too, in a relationship, isn't it? You always. Anybody ever said that before? <laughs> you never. <sighs> always and never are never always and never true. So, he says, Adam, I want you to understand how important your words are. So then, in chapter 2, verse 21, the Lord God caused the man to go into a deep sleep. I must be afraid to take a nap. <laughs> While the man slept, the Lord God took out of one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib and brought her to the man. Only God can do that. Only God can take something out of somebody and put it into somebody else and create something that is perfect. Then, in chapter 1, verse 28, God blessed them. Here's what I want you to do, he said. I want you to be fruitful and I want you to, to multiply. The word blessed here, and go to that, that verse, chapter 1, verse 28. So God created mankind, 27 to 28. God created mankind in his own image, and he blessed them. The, the, the word here for blessed is, is Barack. No, not Barack Obama, just Barack. <laughs> okay. It's the word, Stop. <laughs> It has this picture of Adam and Eve kneeling before God and God performing the first wedding ceremony and blessing it between a man and a woman. That's what the word means. He's marrying them. God performs the first wedding ceremony. And look at the atmosphere that they're in. It's just like this perfect atmosphere. I mean, the temperature is perfect. There's never an argument about the thermostat. I'm cold. I'm hot. That never happens in your house, I know, but um, I'm always cold. My wife is always hot. It's perfectly matched. God put them together. And, and, and it wasn't like Adam had an option, right? <laughs> Like, he's not going to the other part of the garden. He's saying, well, who else is here to choose from? <laughs> it's not like he's going to get on Christian Mingle and say, well, what options do I have here? <laughs> God knew what Adam need, he needed. God knew what Eve needed. And he put them together perfectly. And there's nothing in their history that's affecting them negatively. There's no failures. There's no sin. There's no abuses. There's no addictions. Everything is provided for. There's no arguments over money. Nobody's ever had that discussion before, but there's no discussions over money. There's no issues over money. And honestly, Adam is the perfect husband and Eve is the perfect wife. One pastor was preaching one time, and he said, there's no such thing as a perfect man. And some guy jumped up in the back of the church, and he said, I know a perfect man. And the pastor said, who? The man said, my wife's first husband was perfect. <laughs> they have literal conversations. Listen to this. They're conversing with God every day. There, there's no conflict the hot water never ran out because somebody took a bath for too long. There's no flat tires on the car. There's no speeding tickets. There's no electricity bills. And then it will say this in chapter 2, verse 25. Now the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Now this is literal and figurative. It's literal in the sense Psalm 8 tells us that they were covered in the glory of God. That was their clothing, literally. That's why when they sinned, they, they, they recognized what had happened 
and the glory of God disappears and they see each other for who they really are. Let me tell you something. When you're living in the presence of God, we tend not to see each other's faults as easily as we, as we do. When you're always looking at somebody else's issues and faults and problems, it might be an indication that you don't spend much time in the presence of Jesus because when you do that, you tend not to see each other's issues. But it was also figurative because they're naked and not ashamed, meaning they're totally transparent with each other. They're not hiding stuff. They're open with one another. We tend not to be transparent because of our fears and our failures, and we hide because, either because of it's a continuing issue with us or how somebody's responded to us in the past. So we close up, but God's intent is transparency because transparency leads to freedom. Say that with me, transparency leads to freedom. It does. It's a perfect environment. Now listen to me. Let me spend just a minute here. The goal of the enemy of your family is to disrupt the presence of God in your home. The goal of the enemy is to disrupt the presence of God in your home. Okay, how does he do it? Okay, just stay with me for a moment. The enemy of your family intentionally creates communication confusion to bring a breach in the relationship. Here's how he does it. Okay, so so we go back to this story of Adam and Eve in the garden. Number one, the enemy distorts the word of God. The serpent was clever, more clever than any wild animal God had made, and he spoke to the woman. Now, as I thought about this, I said, I guess in the garden before the fall, animals could talk. I mean, that shouldn't be so hard to believe. (laughs) That's not theologically correct. It's just an observation. It's right there. The animal talked to Eve, and it was an animal that evidently became possessed by something that was evil. He spoke to the woman. Do I understand that God told you not to eat from any tree in the garden? Watch this. That's not what God said. God did not say you could not eat from any tree in the garden. But look what he does. The first thing he does is distort the word of God. You can't eat from any tree in the garden, can you? That's not what God said. As a result of the distorting of the word of God, this causes Eve to distort the command of God. The woman said to the serpent, well, no, not at all. Now, first thing, she's conversing with this thing that is challenging God. Listen to me. It's time for you and I and our marriages and families to stop conversing with something that's trying to destroy your marriage and your family. Don't entertain in your mind. And the problem with a lot of us is we entertain these things in our head and we start to have a conversation with it. She said, not at all. We can eat from the trees in the garden. It's only about the tree in the middle of the garden that God said, don't eat from it. Watch this. Don't even touch it. Find for me the place in Genesis 1 and 2 where God said, don't touch it. It's not there. So when he distorts the word of God, She then distorts the command of God, and this is what we tend to do in our relationships. We add to what God has said or take away from what God has said because we start to reason in our head what we think God might have said when God never said anything. Did you know a study was done a while back? It's in a book. It's called Think Like Jesus. It's by a national pollster organization. It's by George Barna. They did this study of American Christians. And they asked them all kinds of questions of everything that American Christians are supposed to believe. Is Jesus the only way? Is the Bible the word of God? Is there heaven? Is there hell? How do you come to Christ? All that kind of stuff. And then what were they trying to find out was how many Christians in America actually had a biblical worldview. In other words, they ran all of their decision making through the scripture. I'll tell you what we do in America now. We run our decision making through our feelings. 
It's just what I feel. I just, nobody cares about my feelings. <laughs> this is what I think. This is what I feel. So they did this study on American Christians. And, and they were trying to find out, not people that had no relationship with God, but American evangelicals who say we believe we're a believer, we're, we're a Christian. They wanted to find out how many American Christians actually had a biblical worldview, ran their thinking through the scripture. Do you know what the result was? How many, what percentage of Christians in America actually have a biblical worldview? Anybody want to make a guess? Oh, it's a little better than that, okay. <laughs> She's like, 0 0.9, it's a little better than that. 9%. Let's put it into context. That would mean in a church of 100 people, only 9 people get it. That would mean in a church of 1,000 people, only 90 people get it. Because it's really easy for us, isn't it, to, to shift our thinking so it's convenient. Don't, don't eat from it. You don't touch it or you'll die. Well, that in turn causes Satan to distort the character of God. The serpent said to the woman, you're not going to die. You won't die. <sighs> in other words, God's lying to you. What he said isn't true. See, a lot of us think in our family, in our relationships, we can do what we want to do because of our own feelings. And the fact is that we say well, what God said is not really true. Just read the scripture. Yeah, I know what it says, but God knows that at the moment you eat from that tree, you'll see what's really going on. In other words, you'll be just like God. And because God is not a good God, he's trying to withhold something good from you. You'll be just like God. You'll know everything then. You'll know everything. You'll even know more than God. Isn't that the end result of it? I know what the Bible says, but you'll be just like God knowing everything, ranging all the way from good to evil. And, and the goal of the enemy in your life and in your family and your marriage and your kids is to distort the character of God to get us thinking that God doesn't really care about us. God doesn't care about me. He's trying to withhold something from me. Now, watch what happens next. This causes Eve to forget her identity in God. So, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. She's been given an identity in God, but now the reasoning has happened. Anytime I try to reason what God has said into my own reasoning, I will forget who God has called me to be. I will forget my calling as a husband. I'll forget my calling as a wife. I'll forget my calling as a child, as a son, a daughter, a man, a woman. And that is the goal. Our problem in America right now is an identity problem. I don't know if I'm a man or not. I think I'm a woman. I'd make a very ugly woman. It's an identity issue. Because what is the enemy doing in America right now? It's distorting identity. He's distorting identities. Well, I'd be better off with somebody else. I'd be better off in this relationship than that relationship. You know, it's been this way for this long. I'd be better off with, with a different husband, different wife, different parents. I'd be better off in a different kind of religion thing. 
we, we, we forget our identity in God, and we forget the identity that God has called the family to be. He's not called you to be a cultural family. He's called you to be a biblical kingdom-based family. But because, listen, this is all coming in on us all the time through media, through music, through all kinds of different things, and this is being preached at us all day long. This is why you've got to be careful what you listen to. Listen, if she didn't ever listen to the voice of the enemy, she'd have never gotten this issue. But a lot of us are listening to voices we should never be listening to. You know the worst thing you can do in a marriage challenge is to go to somebody else with the same challenge? Well, well no, they understand what I'm feeling. No, no, no. They're not going to tell you the truth. They're going to side. Well, you know, he is, a, he is a real rascal. You're absolutely right. She is the wicked witch of the West. <sighs> no, 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 no. Go to somebody that has already been through the challenge and gotten over in victorious land on the other side. They'll tell you how to get through it, not somebody who's in the middle of the problem. We have an identity issue. Because we don't understand who God has called us to be. God has a great purpose for you. God has great identity for you. As a man, as a woman, as a boy, as a girl, as a teenager, the identity in God that he has placed within you at conception. It, it, it's, it's absolutely amazing. But life comes in and our identity gets shifted. This is the goal of the enemy is to shift your thinking to something that God never called you to be. And a result of that, this causes Adam to forfeit his purpose as a man of God. I mean, where's Adam at this moment? Oh, he's out fishing. No, he's not. He's right there beside her. I mean, like I'm saying... I get that men don't speak up sometimes. I get that, like, we're quiet sometimes. We just don't communicate. I get it, guys. And I was saying to myself, Adam, uh, your wife's getting ready to do something here. It's probably not a good idea. You probably ought to say something. She gave some to her husband. Okay, why isn't he saying... Uh, I don't think this is a good idea, Eve, because God talked to me before you were here. Okay. We had like this conversation. Me and God were talking, and he said, this is a bad idea. He forgets his purpose as a man of God. She gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. Oh, yeah, their eyes got opened. And the glory of God disappeared. They realized they were naked and they had to do something to cover themselves up. Understand that the enemy of your family intentionally creates communication confusion to bring a breach in the relationship with each other and ultimately God. You realize that when it comes to communication, that 10% of communication is words, Hello. 30% of communication is sounds. Hello. 60% of communication is body language. Hello. <laughs> and, and what the enemy is trying to do with your relationships and in our homes, listen, is to affect the atmosphere of the home to where the presence of God is not welcome. See, God wants to be there. But our attitudes, our thoughts, our words, our perceptions so often create the atmosphere that's uninviting to the presence of the Lord. You see, the things that we watch, and, and you know, I'm not... I'm not trying to be like legalistic, okay? But here's the problem in America anymore. Anytime you start to talk about something, oh, that's just legalism. Well, if you're, let me just tell you, if you're watching porn, 
And for me to say don't do that, it's going to affect the atmosphere of your home and your own mind and your life. That's not legalism, that's life. How is it that we expect to pray over somebody in the name of Jesus be healed on Sunday morning when on Saturday night we were entertained by programs that took the name of the Lord in vain and we didn't blink an eye? And we don't realize that the atmosphere of our homes, listen, we think the church is supposed to affect the home. The home is supposed to affect the church. Listen, the atmosphere of the church is entirely affected by what goes on in the atmosphere of the home. Because we bring who we are into the house of God. We don't suddenly change on Sunday morning because, you know, oh, I'm in church now. Everything shifts. No, nothing shifts. I just bring in what I am. And this is why sometimes we have to fight through stuff on Sunday morning, fight through attitudes, fight through spirits, fight through stuff to get to the place where, where people can even be ministered to because we brought it in. Now, here's my belief, is that part of the purpose of the church is to create an atmosphere to where the stuff that we bring in, we leave here and don't take it back out and we're free. Do you, you understand what I'm saying? But the reality of it is, if I walk back into the same atmosphere that I created in the house and nothing changes and I make no change with it, then all I do is repeat the cycle from week to week to week to week. So, so here's, here's our communication. I know the Bible says, but ah, she, he won't listen. I can't talk to him, or I can't talk to her. I'm tired of being the only one who tries. Oh, they're never going to change. Or we just kind of drifted apart. Can I tell you a conversation my wife and I had this week? We've been married 30 years. I see somebody who's been married 86 years. I think 30 years is a long time. 86 years is like an eternity. <laughs> I just probably dug a hole for myself right there. <laughs> I need to take a drink of water on that one. I tell you the conversation we had this week. We said, we just can't think that because we've been married 30 years, I'm paraphrasing, that we can just take it for granted that we'll be married another 30 years. We said that if we don't become intentional in our relationship, then we're just going to drift apart. And there's a lot of marriages, you're living in the same house, but you don't have a relationship. You're business partners, but you're not God's partners. And we said, you know, we've got to be intentional about this. We just can't think that it's just, and we got to, what we said was we have to protect ourselves. We have to protect our marriage, protect our morals, and protect everything about our life. We've got to be intentional with it. It's just not going to happen if you're not intentional with it. Well, we just drifted apart. Or oh, you're here, I can't take the pain anymore. Or I can't forgive. Or God just wants me happy, and I'm not happy. Well, of course, nobody wants you miserable. Let me clarify what I said last week, because what if marriage is about holiness and not happiness? I wasn't suggesting that you can't be happy. <laughs> it's awful. I'm holy, but I'm so miserable. <laughs> I'm not suggesting that. But, but, but our culture is so into defining what happiness is. Because we watch so many movies and listen to so much media that's defining for us our morals and our happiness. We're not running through our life through the scripture. So, I'm just not happy. I'm not happy. <laughs> you know, unhappy people create unhappy people. The atmosphere of your home is created a lot of times by the attitudes that you bring in every time you wake up in the morning and when you go to bed at night.
counseling doesn't work. No, we certainly couldn't get somebody else's biblical opinion, could we? God didn't answer my prayers. Everybody knows my business. I, I don't know how many people I've heard say, everybody knows what's going on in my marriage in that church. You know, pre-COVID, I mean, it's probably somewhere close to it, but pre, pre-COVID, you know, it's about 1,200 people that call this church home. I don't really know how many we have anymore, to be honest with you. We'll figure that out later. But Do you really think that everybody knows your business? No, nobody knows your business. The church is too big for that. Now, if your church was 15 people, maybe... If you were brought up in a very small church, growing up, everybody knew everybody else's business. Nobody knows your business. They don't even know who you are, let alone know your business. The kids will be fine. It'll all work out. The kids will be fine. The kids are never fine. I can't talk to you. Or you can say this, I choose to trust and believe God and his promises. Here's the text again, musicians. After I looked things over, I stood up and I said, I looked things over. And I did not say, it's hopeless. I said, fight for your families, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. God's just looking for some people who will believe him and hope in him and trust in him. That, that, that's how God's looking for. He's just looking for somebody that'll do that. Because I didn't realize this. Can you help me, Eric? I didn't realize this. But your influence is far greater than you, you realize. Just, just, just as an individual, you're, you're influencing just about 100 a, a people that are around you already. Say, well, nobody's watching me. Ooh, yes, they are. You have people at work, you have friends, you have neighbors. And what I am contending for, what the staff of this church is contending for, what the leaders of this church are contending for, we're not just saying, oh, yeah, we kind of hope it happens. No! We are contending for something to move in your family and in your home that totally changes everything. You say, yeah, 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 okay. Okay. You've been married 30 years and you you, you, you're good, you guys talk. I really wish people would stop looking at pastors as though they never have to work through stuff. That's just ridiculous. Life is life. Humans are humans. Males are males and females are females. to say, God, isn't there something that you could do? Say, I don't even know how to pray. Perfect. Because a lot of us have been in this for so long, we got it all figured out. And that's the reason why nothing's changing, because you got it all figured out. You know better. Now, bless God, I've been in this a long time. I've been in church a long time. I know some things. That's the most dangerous place for you to be. Because the place that God wants us to be is, God, I don't have any answers. I've discovered this about leadership in general. That when I approach a leadership issue with, I've done this before, I know what to do. I'm liable not to get a good answer and make a bad decision because I have to approach everything as, God, I don't know anything. So wait a minute, you've been doing this for 35 years. That's my point. Okay, I discovered a leadership principle from the Apostle Paul when he said, I don't know what to do. I am weak. And he said, his strength is made complete in my weakness. So if you want a leadership strategy, get weak and you'll find the wisdom and the strength of God. Okay? You want to lead your home, get weak. 
You want to lead your marriage? Get weak. Because it's in that moment that God can say, I appreciate your honesty, that you're not all that smart. And I've discovered the older I get, I'm not all that smart. But I do have a God that's willing to come alongside and say, let me show you what you need to do here. And when I can humble myself, guys, when you can humble yourself, ladies, when you can humble yourself, teenagers, with your parents, when you can humble yourself, you will invite the presence of God back into your relationships. And a lot of you are going through difficult situations right now, not because you did something wrong. It's because God's trying to get you to a place where you finally depend on Him instead of yourself. So let's do this. Let's stand together for a minute, can we? I'm probably going to totally mess up the dismissal today, but I mess up frequently. Everybody in the room, would you just lift your hands toward the Lord for a moment, and would you pray for weakness? <laughs> yeah, okay, I'm asking you. Pray for the spirit of humility and weakness over your life and your family, your business, whatever you do, and particularly over your marriage. Say, God, I, I'm really not all that smart, God. I'm really not all that smart. No, you're not going to lean into hopelessness. You're not going to lean on what has been. You're going to lean on what can be. Those of you watching online right now, lean into the strength of God by giving up your strength and becoming weak. If you're with a family member right now, just put your hand on their shoulder and say, God, I humble myself into the weakness of the Lord. And to receive your strength. Holy Spirit, we take authority as a position that you've given us in this house. We take authority over everything that wants to take authority in our garden of our home. God, we're going to work some things out, but we're going to cast other things out. We refuse to allow the devil to have control anymore of our minds, our kids, our habits. We speak a word of freedom and deliverance over your family right now. We speak the word of the power of God to do something that's never been done. And in Jesus' name, be gone. Out! 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 In Jesus' name. Father, I speak peace. I speak your presence. I speak what's never been done before. I speak over every bondage, every addiction, every issue that's kept the atmosphere of the garden of our home from being in the presence of God. I pray for moves of God in our marriage and in our families, God, among our children, Lord. I pray, God, things that are in our home, Lord, that are squelching the presence of God, we'll get rid of them, we'll remove them. And I pray things in drawers, things in fridges, things under beds, things on computers. We will delete them. We will throw them out and invite the presence of God back into our homes, Lord. Oh, God, we desperately need your presence in our homes, God. I need the presence of God in our home, Lord Jesus. Help us, Heavenly Father. Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Just wait on the Lord a minute. Spirit of God, just say this, Spirit of God, I open 
myself up in our home, God. I open my home up to your presence. God, help me to do what I need to do, God. I open my home up to your presence, Jesus. Open our home up to your presence, oh God. Help us to be obedient to what you ask us to do in our homes, Jesus. Help us, Lord. Holy Spirit, help us. Holy Spirit, help us. Oh, yes, Jesus. I trust you, Lord. I trust you, Lord. I trust you, Lord. As your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed right now, maybe you're in the rooms. It all starts with a relationship with Jesus. You can't go anywhere without that. I believe the Lord told me yesterday there's going to be a dramatic salvation in the house today. I don't know who you are, but you need to start with a relationship with God and say, God, I give my life to you. And everybody that pray this prayer with me as your heads are bowed right now, say, Lord Jesus, I'm not going to run from you anymore. I want you in my life. With my heart, I believe. With my mouth, I confess Jesus as my Savior. And I turn from my sins. In Jesus' name. Your heads are bowed. Who prayed the prayer with me? In minute right now. Let me see your hand across this room. Thank you. Who else minute today? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your honesty. 